So today we're going to meet to discuss the status of actions taken in response to the lessons learned from the Fukushima Daiichi accident that happened in Japan March 11, 2011. It's been about eight months since our last update. We did that last summer. And so we'll hear the progress that the NRC has made and that the industry has made in those in that intervening time. In, those, in these past eight months, much has occurred, including completion of seismic and flooding walkdowns at each nuclear plant facility, a commission decision on the issue of filtering strategies for boiling water reactors with Mark I and Mark II containment designs, and the receipt of integrated plans from each nuclear power plant licensee uh, to implement the March 12th, 2012 orders on mitigating strategies. So today we're going to hear from two separate panels. First, a panel of external uh, <coughs> folks, including representatives from the nuclear industry, the Union of Concerned Scientists, and the Illinois Emergency Management Agency. And following these presentations, we will have uh, the NRC staff come up and brief us on the NRC's progress. So just a few reminders before we begin, please keep your remarks to 10 minutes so that we can get through everybody in time and to the extent possible, all of you, including those of you that I see on a daily basis, remember to reduce your use of acronyms so that we are as transparent as possible. I think we are ready to begin. Again, uh, now we have a presentation from the NRC staff and I will turn it over to William Borchardt, the Executive Director for Operations. Well, good morning. Thank you. Um, before Mike and the team begin the, uh, the real presentation, I'd just like to make a, a few points. First, I'd like to acknowledge and thank all of the stakeholders for their valuable contribution throughout this entire process. It's been a very intense, sometimes difficult two years, and without their contribution, it would have been impossible for us to get to where we are. I'd also like to acknowledge the efforts of the Steering Committee and the Japan Lessons Learned Directorate because uh, they've been at the forefront of all the progress that the NRC staff has made. Uh, having said that, I think we're at a unique position in time now. We are transitioning, in my view, from uh, a period of policy decisions to one of implementation. And that's afforded us the opportunity to take a serious look at how we uh, address the issue that David Lockbaum uh, uh, mentioned this morning and one that we agree with, that we want to try to get our process back into the normal line function responsibilities at the right time. We think that right time is, is coming up, probably toward the end of this year, in my view. I mean, that, that could change. but. Um, the makeup of the steering committee made sure that we didn't get disconnected. It's largely made up of representatives from the major program offices, and just by that fact alone, we made sure that the operating reactor fleet and our regulatory oversight of that on the day-to-day -day mission uh, type activities didn't become disconnected from the work of the Fukushima lessons learned. However, returning these activities more to the line function, I think, will have additional benefits. So, uh, Mike, if we have time, we'll mention that uh, later on in the presentation this morning. I'd also like to mention how valuable the international interactions have been throughout this process. We learned uh, lessons from the international community very early on the process. The uh, near-term task force did a tremendous job given the time constraints we put them under. But having said that, there were some items that weren't included that we learned from our interactions with the international community. That interaction continues to this day in a very robust way, both through bilateral interactions, but also through the work of uh, uh, International Atomic Energy Agency and the Nuclear Energy Agency. Um, and the next Convention on Nuclear Safety uh, review meeting, which is about a year from now, will again have a very strong focus on Fukushima lessons learned. And it's through that that every regulatory agency in the world is bringing to the table what they're doing, what their industry is doing in response to Fukushima so that we can cross calibrate. I think we're in very good position today uh, based on our understanding of what's being done around the rest of the world. So, th But it has been a very valuable source of information. So I'll turn it over to Mike. 
Good morning, Chairman and Commissioners. Um, we're happy to be here today to discuss the status of the Fukushima Lessons Learned activities from the staff's perspective. Um, today, uh, Dave Skeen, will this, who is the director of the Japan Lessons Learned Project Directorate, will, work, will walk through the three orders that were issued on March 12th. Scott Flanders, then, who is director of the Division of Site Safety and Environmental Analysis and the Office of New Reactors, will give you an update on status and, of seismic and flooding. And then uh, Eric Leeds, who is the director of the Office of Nuclear Reactor Regulation, uh, will discuss the rulemakings in the Tier 2 and Tier 3 um, activities. Uh, slide 3, please. Before we begin, I'd like to make uh, a few points. Uh, the first is that in its report in July of 2011, the near-term task force noted that the current regulatory approach and the resultant plant capabilities uh, allow the task force to conclude that a sequence of events like the Fukushima accident is unlikely to occur in the U.S. Some measures have been implemented, uh, reducing the likelihood of core damage uh, and radiological releases, and therefore continued operation and continued licensing activities do not pose an imminent uh, risk to public health and safety. Uh, we supported those uh, conclusions at that time. Uh, we continue to support those conclusions today. Um, Notwithstanding that, we do believe that enhancements are appropriate, enhancements focused on ensuring protection uh, and thus the actions with respect to reevaluating and upgrading the seismic and flooding design bases, um, flooding protection. Uh, with respect to enhancing mitigation, uh, strengthening station blackout mitigation for beyond design basis external events, I know I've used that word. I've used the word that I tried to avoid in this uh, presentation based on the discussion of the last uh, last panel, but certainly uh, that really was focused on strengthening our protection, if you will, enhancing our mitigation uh, with respect to uh, those types of uh, accidents. And then finally, strengthening emergency procedures for prolonged station blackout and multi-unit events. And um, on slide three, um, on slide three, so on slide three, I do want to make the point that, uh, and Commissioner Savinicki touched on this a little bit, we were driven by principles, and those principles had us, in fact, make sure that we were focused on, did not distract from our focus on operational safety and security, that we didn't displace other high-priority activities, and last but not least, we did want to make sure, do want to make sure that we take action promptly, but we want to do things right the first time. That uh, certainly was a guiding principle. Uh, now slide four, please. As we, uh, as was discussed in the previous panel uh, and is highlighted on this slide, and certainly you'll hear uh, more discussion later, uh, we do believe that considerable progress has been made, and in fact, substantial safety enhancements will be made, will be in place uh, by 2016. Of course, uh, some of those enhancements uh, to safety will extend uh, beyond the 2016 timeframe, and some of those uh, we'll discuss also as we go. We were, we were well served by the activities of the, of the near-term task force, um, but reflecting on a point that Commissioner Ostendorf made in the, with the previous panel, we certainly have, uh, through the work of the steering committee, through the work of the staff, uh, in, with engagement of the industry and other external stakeholders, we've continued to learn and we've continued to apply those learnings in the way in which we've approached uh, the lessons learned activities. In some instances, that provided for more integrated actions, in some instances, broader actions, and in a number of instances, earlier actions being taken. And so we think this process, again, built on uh, and continues uh, to get better um, based on the work of all of the, with the NRC, of, with all of the stakeholders in addressing these issues. Um, and you'll hear that uh, discussed, uh, or Eric and Dave will give examples that sort of illustrate uh, those particular points. Also, um, as addressed, uh, as we address the lessons learned, um, we looked for opportunities to, to, to take earlier action on uh, activities that, that gave us the, the, the best, if you will, or the greatest safety benefit um, so that we could take additional time to do the detailed work that it takes to resolve some of these longer standing issues. So again, I think that was discussed at the previous panel. Um, Scott's uh, discussion in the area of seismic will, will illustrate uh, one, at least one case uh, where we found that to be the case. Uh, slide five, please. This slide uh, touches briefly on uh, some of the related efforts to the near-term task force. Uh, Eric will spend a few minutes or 
um, talking about recommendation one, uh, and so I'll not talk further about that now. Uh, with respect to the risk management regulatory framework, of course, that uh, activity um, uh, focuses on a strategic vision and options for the framework. We've got direction from the commission. We've uh, informed the recommendation one work based on that, uh, that uh, particular um, product, and we'll come back to the commission, of course, with, uh, with plans uh, following the commission's SRM on recommendation one. We are implementing the commission's actions on uh, economic consequences, namely to update uh, our regulatory analysis procedures. Um, we have uh, prioritized actions uh, to ensure timely implementation of the most risk-informed improvements. And then finally, uh, with respect to application of lessons learned to other regulated facilities, we have, uh, the staff has developed a plan. Uh, we've been briefed, the steering committee has been briefed on that plan, and we look uh, to engage uh, and begin implementing that plan uh, later this year. So that uh, concludes my overview, and now let me turn to Dave. Well, thanks, Mike. And good morning, Chairman McFarland and Commissioners. Uh, it's certainly a pleasure to be here today to discuss the staff's progress in implementing the lessons learned from the accident at Fukushima Daiichi. Uh, the staff has been working diligently over the last two years to enhance the safety at U.S. nuclear power plants. We have focused on taking regulatory actions to ensure that the plants can cope with external events that could lead to a prolonged loss of electrical power and a loss of cooling water at power reactor sites. Uh, this slide provides a summary of the regulatory actions that are currently underway. Uh, as you are well aware, uh, we issued three orders and a request for information just over a year ago in March of 2012. We also initiated two rulemakings uh, at that time. Uh, one is to address the station blackout and mitigating strategies that uh, will build on the uh, actions that are being taken by the order, and also another rulemaking that will integrate the licensee emergency response procedures uh, to deal with severe accidents at nuclear power plants. In the next couple of slides, I'll focus uh, on the progress we've been making on the orders. Next slide, please. So the Tier 1 uh, order status, uh, after the implementation guidance was issued in August of 2012, uh, the licensees developed their integrated plans to provide uh, details on how the orders would be implemented at each plant. Uh, and they submitted those plans to us in February of this year. Since then, the NRC staff has been reviewing the integrated plans for, for two of the orders uh, that address the mitigating strategies for the beyond design basis events and also the enhanced spent fuel pool instrumentation uh, so that we can ensure the plants uh, meet the intent of the orders. Uh, in our reviews, we've taken into account the refueling outage schedules for each plant and prioritized our review of the plans so that all licensees will have sufficient time to design and install the plant modifications in accordance with the schedules that we laid out in the orders once we approve their plans. We intend to issue the safety evaluations on each plan with the first safety evaluations to be issued by the end of May and following through the summer until the fall, and all of them will be done by the end of November of this year. All licensees will implement plant modifications within two refueling outages. Many of the plants will be in full compliance after their outages in 2014. Some more will be finished in 2015, and all plants will be in full compliance with the orders by the end of 2016. Next slide, please. The third order uh, that was originally issued to require a reliable hardened containment uh, vent system at all boiling water reactors with the Mark I and Mark II containments uh, uh, was also issued at the same time as the other two orders. However, uh, the Commission recently uh, directed the staff to revise this order. In response to a November 2012 notation vote paper that was developed by the staff and made recommendations for additional requirements for the Mark I and Mark II containment venting systems, the Commission directed the staff to follow a two-step two process. The first step was to revise the order that we had issued last year to require that the containment vent also remain functional during severe accident conditions after the reactor core has been damaged. We are currently working to issue this revised order by the end of May, and the implementation guidance for this order will be complete by September. The second step of the process is to develop a rulemaking that will consider filtration strategies to decontaminate and confine the potential release of radioactive material during a severe accident, and this includes the option of installing engineered containment filtering systems. The regulatory basis for the order for the rule is to, is to be done within one year, and the final rule will be issued within four years. 